Hey, what's happening? Jeff here, Metal Man of 66. Now, I have refrained from doing these trendy, and they are trendy, I don't care what anybody says, they're trendy, topical response videos, but I know that's kind of the thing to do. And I decided I was bored tonight and I wanted to see if I could actually do this. It turned out to be pretty fucking hard, um, but this is a response video for the Rock Scout and my bros Nick over at Thralls, Matt the Dark Path, those are the guys that I know that have done it. Um, and it is the 10 terrible tracks on killer albums. Now terrible and killer are ad adjectives describing you know, our, our musical tastes. And frankly, it's a very, very subjective thing. Um, what you think is killer and what I think is killer might be very, very different. You may think that British Steel is killer, whereas I think it's a good album. But I think Defenders of the Faith is killer, and you may think, eh, it's not that great. So, you know, this is kind of one of those nebulous sort of topics that can get a little edgy, I guess maybe we might say because you know and, and I think we do it just to throw some topics out there into the VC uh, to spark some interest from numbers of people and to get some varied opinions and to see some things that are in one another's collection and um, so I decided to jump into it but again I think it's real important to clarify that tastes are very subjective and therefore what I think is a killer album and what I think is a terrible track is probably very different from what Nick thinks is or what Matt might think is or what Rick over at the Dreadful Minutes might think is or Jake over at Hymns of My Upside Down, uh, upside down Hymns of My Church or something like that. Sorry Jake, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, so it's like this took me a lot more time than I really want to admit that it should have. And I will say that only about half my picks are metal. Because as many of you know that if you follow my channel, you'll know that I'm not just 100% balls to the wall, black metal, death metal guy. I've got a lot of it, but it's not, it doesn't make up two-thirds or even 80% of my collection. It's maybe half or less. I got a lot of classic rock, I got a lot of prog rock, I got a lot of jazz, I got a lot of other shit in there. But most of this is either classic rock or and a little bit of alternative rock and um, some metal. So, let's start with the metal. 1990. Saw the release of this album by a band from New York City called Warrior Soul. I love these guys. They put out four killer albums, well, three killer albums, one pretty good album, and then they just fell into shitter, and I haven't followed them since the Chill Pill album, which was the fourth album. After I saw Space Age Love Boys and listened to that, I was like, fuck this band. And uh, Corey, his voice is so fucking fried, it's, it's disgusting. Plus, John Ricci isn't in the band anymore, and um, Paul Ferguson, the drummer on this album, went back to... Killing Joke after I think the first album or the second album I can't remember which maybe maybe he was on the first three I don't remember but uh, and also the uh, the bass player was murdered I believe in this band um, in the UK somewhere uh, quite a long time ago anyways this album came out it got a lot of push it was one of Geffen's big metal albums and this is a fucking metal album man it's not grunge it's fucking heavy as shit it's punky at times. Last Decade, De Dead Century by Warrior Soul. And I'll tell you, this is damn near a fucking perfect album, except for the Four More Years interlude that is on here. It's about a four-minute pastiche of Corey Clark with weirded fucking sped-up and helium-tinged vocals, or not vocals, but spoken word. And he's going off because he was super political, which is cool, I understand that. This was during the Bush era, I believe. Um, and you know it had to you know there's parts of the thousand points of light speech in there and all that shit but it just interrupts the flow of the album and it's just 
I skip it every time because it's dumb. I'm not saying the subject matter is dumb, but it's dumb to listen to. It wasn't. It, it doesn't help the album in any ways, especially when you got songs like "I See the Ruins," "We Cry Out," "The Losers," "Downtown," "Tripping on Ecstasy," "Superpower Dreamland," "Lullaby." Fuck, man, blown away. Charlie's out of prison. This fucking album will kick your fucking ass in seconds flat. But that song really ruins the flow of the album. So that's number one. This one, I'm going to get a lot of shit for this probably because a lot of people are going to say, that's not a perfect album. But for me, it's probably my second favorite Priest album, which I'll have to go back and watch my Priest video, my Priest box set video to even find out if, if that's what I said because shit changes with me every other day. But... Defenders of the Faith. Okay, I know what you're thinking. The production on here is not very good. It's very 80s. That synthetic fucking drum sound is awful. It's very um, uh, hollow sounding. It's got that real 80s shit production. But man, seriously, Free Will Burning, Jawbreaker, Rock Hard Ride Free, the fucking Sentinel. The Sentinel. Yeah. Love Bites, I love that song. Eat Me Alive, I love that song. Heads Are Gonna Roll, Night Comes Down. And then, Heavy Duty. Heavy Duty. I don't even know what the hell that sounds like. I had to go listen to it to remember what it was like. And it's just a real average track. Doesn't suck, isn't terrible, I guess. But it's terrible to me on an album that's pretty damn near perfect because then it ends with Defenders of the Faith. And, um... You know, again, the production is a question mark, obviously, but to me, this is right after Stained Class and maybe Sin After Sin. I, those are my these are my top three. Was screaming probably at four. Um, this fucking album rules, and it's the only major name band that I. Well, no, I have one other major name band in here. Um, as far as the metal, it's the only major name band that I I went with because I I looked at. Iron Maiden, and everybody was picking Seventh Son or, um, you know, uh, Number of the Beast or Power Slave or, you know, Peace of Mind. And to be honest with you, most of those albums are pretty damn near perfect for me. And I really couldn't find a track. Like everybody was talking about Seventh Son and how Can I Play With Madness sucks. I love Can I Play With Madness. In fact, my channel's kind of halfway named after it. So, nah. Not, not for me. I, I, I love that. I, I couldn't find anything with Maiden. I couldn't find anything with Emperor. I looked at Emperor thinking, oh, there's got to be something on In Night Side Eclipse that sucks. Nope. Anthems at Welkin. Nope. There are songs on uh, Prometheus and uh, I forget the name of the third album. I always forget. I, I, uh, can't remember the name of it. Um, those are decent albums. But there's no way they're perfect albums and they have way more than one track I don't like. Uh, Testament, same thing. I love most Testament albums, but I couldn't find a Testament album that was almost perfect. I found a lot that were close, but there were two tracks I didn't particularly like or that were kind of lackluster. So that was not going to fly either. Um, but one other metal band that I did find was this band. Metal Church's debut, Metal Church. If you are a metal fan and you don't know this album, shame on you. This fucking album kicks ass. People call it a thrash album. I don't really think it is. I think it's more of a trad metal, a little bit of a power metal, U.S. power metal vibe to it, mostly traditional metal. There is thrash in here, but it's I wouldn't exactly call it metal church of thrash band they had one of the fucking most amazing singers the first two albums in david wayne and this album showcases him so does the dart for that matter too but the reason i picked this album was that i mean it kicks off with two of the most heavy hitting badass fucking metal tracks you're ever going to hear in beyond the black and the metal church or metal church and then it continues with merciless onslaught a killer fucking instrumental Gods of Wrath, the, the ballad is killer. Hitman is just this thrashy ass kicker. In the Blood and My Favorite Nightmare and Battalions, again, they just fucking kill. And 
And then on a debut, we've got a cover of a Deep Purple song. Now, Highway Star is a great fucking tune. It's a killer tune. It's a heavy metal song. There's no question. But it just, on a debut album from a metal band, I'm, I struggle with covers to begin with. I really struggle with metal bands doing covers. I rarely like them. It's unusual that I, especially a heavy metal band doing a classic rocker, classic metal type band i just don't i don't generally like them but for this band one of the big things about highway star is the fucking keyboards of john lord and you don't have the keyboards on here it's just a straight up you know traditional heavy it's not bad but it just kind of ruins the album it ruins the flow of the album for me because this album is one of my favorite all-time favorite albums top 25 album for me forever and yeah, that was not a good choice. I wish, you know, Kirk Vanderhoof is such a great songwriter. I can't believe somebody thought that was a great idea, but to me, it's not. So, Metal Church, Metal Church, no bueno with the uh, Highway Star cover. Next up, a classic metal, hard rock, however you want to, you know, I think they're kind of metal at times, or at least they were in their early albums. They were classic rock, I guess, but I, I still think the Scorpions are pretty metal. This is taken by Force. This is not the original cover. It's the reissue. Um, my favorite Scorpions album by far. I like pretty much all the Scorpions from Lonesome, the weirdness of Lonesome Crow all the way up through... Uh, let's see. The last one I probably liked was the one I uh, loved the first thing with Big City Nights. And, you know, there's a lot of radio-friendly hits on there, but I saw them a couple times. They're great live. They are great live. And after that album, I think they came out with an album called Savage Amusement, which was a pile of shit. And I don't really think they've recovered since then. I, I haven't heard one Scorpion song in 20 years that I dug at all. Um, but this one was Uli John Roth's last album with that. Well, Tokyo Taste was his last release, I guess. But this was the last actual album with him on it. And it, this album is a fucking banger, man. Steam Rock Fever, We'll Burn the Sky. Ah. Oh. Uh, the Ride of Your Time, The Sales of Sharon. Come on, man. The Sales of Sharon. That is the beginning of Euro classic, classical metal. That's where Ingve took his cues. Yes, Ingve took his cues from Uli. I'm saying it right here, right now. Uh, your Light, He's a Woman, She's a Man, fucking killer. How did they know that long ago? Uh, Born to Touch Your Feelings and this has Polar Nights from Tokyo Tapes and Suspender Love so they're not real album tracks that were on the original but there's a song here called I've Got to Be Free kind of feels and sounds like a throwaway tune and it kind of reeks of 60's kind of vibe to it I struggle with whether I wanted to go with this one or Love Drive because there's one song on Love Drive I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Let me see if I have it here. Yeah, I don't know what the hell I did with it. Yeah, I don't know what I did with that. I must have put it away. But um, there's one track on Love Drive that kind of is like a reggae song that kind of blows. But it's actually got some cool parts in it. The chorus is kind of cool. So I went with this one. I've got to be free. I couldn't even remember the name of it. That's how forgettable it is. I always skip it. Last Metal CD, Pure Metal, Slayer, South of Heaven, probably my favorite Slayer other than maybe Hell Awaits, which I do not own, I do not have a copy of that, and that's a perfect album for me. Um, Slayer, so many great albums to begin with, their last good album for me though absolutely was Seasons in the Abyss, and I struggle with whether to go with that one or this one. Um, I went with this one because I really fucking love every song on this. The riff to South of Heaven always blows my mind. That minor third thing that he's doing just, oh, it's so fucking good. Uh, Silent Scream's killer. Live Undead is killer. Behind the Crooked Cross is badass. Mandatory Suicide, Ghost of War. But then we get to that song, Read Between the Lines. And what's crazy about the Read Between the Lines song is it pretty much mimics South of Heaven's guitar lines. 
until it gets to the chorus and in the chorus it does the tritone thing and it's just a boring chorus i don't really like the song very much and it kind of ruins the flow because after that it goes to cleanse the soul and dissonant aggressor the the um uh, priest cover which is kick ass and cleanse the soul is a fucking punky rocking thrashing piece of meat and then you got the killer spill the blood at the end um i like this album better than rain and blood i like it better than um seasons in the abyss i don't like it better than hell wait it's probably my second favorite but it's it's close to being a perfect album but read between the lies doesn't cut it for me it's an okay it's an okay track but it's you know is it terrible again with the semantics of what is subjective to me and what i think is terrible and what you may think is terrible i don't think it's a terrible track it's just pretty forgettable and it kind of ruins doesn't ruin but it it's it's a filler track for me and that's kind of what i look at these as i don't look at them as maybe necessarily terrible songs but i look at them as filler tracks or things that i'd rather it just not be on there i'd rather it just be nine tracks or whatever however many were on here 10 tracks so i'd rather just be nine tracks because that track just doesn't do anything for me all right moving on we're gonna get into some classic rock we're gonna look at one of my absolute favorite bands and one of my absolute favorite albums a top 20 album for me maybe a top 10 album for me is the canadian band triumph i did not pull any rush by the way it's too hard because most of their perfect albums are fucking perfect and I could never pull a bad track off of them. Or their really good albums have one or two tracks and I'm kind of like, yeah, yeah, that's a throwaway song. Um, this one, although I would throw probably Caress of Steel in there with I Think I'm Going Bald, kind of a lame track. I don't hate it, but I don't love it. But everything else on uh, Caress of Steel is badass, but I didn't pull it out. But anyway... That's a bonus 11th album there. Triumph, Just the Game. Man, I fucking love this album. I've shown this before. Met Rick Emmett back in 2012, and he signed it for me. Such a cool-ass dude. Such a huge inspiration for my guitar playing. Love that guy. Sweetheart of a dude, too. Uh, this album, unfortunately, starts off with a song that I really don't like. It's, man, it's a song called Moving On. And it's a... In Triumph, if you're not aware, two singers, the drummer, uh, Gilmore, was more the hard, rocky, bluesy singer. And then you had Rick Emmett, the guitar player and writer of a lot of their material, the better material. And he was more the proggy, poppier, prog, hard rock singer. And of most of their hits, with the exception of maybe, I don't know, Spellbound and maybe allied nations or allied forces um rick sang most of their big hits and on this album it's no different he sings lay it on the line which is a stone cold motherfucking classic and i defy anyone to say it isn't uh young enough to cry is gil he's great on that it's a great song american girls that's gil again too that's a that's a great rocker just a game that's their super fucking proggy title track of this album and it's so badass fantasy serenades a little guitar interlude that's great and hold on which is rick's masterful prog epic on here just amazing song and suitcase blues which is a really cool bluesy jazz number that rick does that i absolutely fucking love and his playing is superlative and this album rots but they could have not started it with moving on i really wish they wouldn't have maybe if they'd have put it at the end of the album it would have been better but it just doesn't fit on the album. So again, you know, this is a uh, an eight album track. Keep in mind, this is from 1979 when albums were 35, 40 minutes tops. So, you know, if they were to cut moving on off of a four minute track, they probably would have only had a 28 minute album or something like that. So just a game. Uh, triumph. Next one. This one I owe the credit to my buddy John. At Metalhead's podcast, uh, he he reminded me of this. You know, most of us, if you're my age, you're in your fifties. I'm almost fifty-six. Uh, we're in your forties. Most of you guys are fully aware of Led Zeppelin and probably listened to a lot of Led Zeppelin in college when you were getting stoned or getting drunk. 
Um, excuse me, I gotta move my chair a little bit here. I'm getting old. Um, you know, I listened to Zeppelin endlessly when I was in my teens and 20s because that was what was going on. You know, I almost went to see Led Zeppelin in 1980. Um, when I was in ninth grade, I had... Uh, Tickets were going on sale like a week a week after John Bonham died, and I was super psyched to see Led Zeppelin because they were they were gods to me. You know, this is my favorite Zeppelin album, uh, bar none, because it is just so fucking complete. I like all the Zeppelin albums for the most part, except for the last one and Coda. But um, you know, you got Custard Pie, The Rover, In My Time of Dying. <laughs> Houses of the Holy, Trampled Underfoot, Cashmere. I don't know, if you're a fan of heavy music or rock music in general, that's a perfect album right there on side one. And side two, In the Light, Brawny R, Down by the Seaside, Ten Years Gone, Night Flight, Wanton Song. And then it kind of gets a little wonky with Boogie with Stu. I don't like that song very much, and John reminded me why I went back and listened to him. Like, eh. Again, is it a terrible song? No. Do I hate it? No. Do I skip it? Yeah. Because right after that is Black Country Woman and Sick Again. And I mean, damn near a perfect album. Is Boogie With Stu like a massive major offender? No, but it's it's kind of a cheesy song in a lot of ways, I guess. Um, classic fucking album that didn't need to have that song on it. But I guess they thought it did. But anyways, Led Zeppelin. Physical Graffiti. Boogie was... <laughs> Stu. I didn't know if we could do live albums, but I don't have a lot of live albums because I, while I do go to a lot, or did go to a lot of live shows, I'm not a live album guy very much. I don't love live albums, but this is one of the greatest live albums ever. And ironically... It ties in with uh, the Metal Church selection and the song Highway Star because this is the OG band that did that song. And this is one of the, if not the greatest live albums, it's certainly right up there with like Strangers in the Night from UFO and um, Kiss Alive. And I know, I, I know, they're not, Frampton Comes Alive. I know, those albums weren't really all live, I get it, but... As far as I know, this one's fairly close. I'm sure there was a lot of overdubs, but um, uh, this album is just fucking sick, man. Uh, made in Japan, double CD that is just fucking kick-ass. Leads off with Highway Star, Child in Time, Smoke on the Water. All right. I happen to like that song still. Of course, it was the first song I probably learned to play on the guitar. Or was it? Might not have been. Might have been a Rush song that I learned first. But, um, yeah, I don't love that song, but I can listen to it. It's not one that I go, oh, God, I got to turn it off, you know. Um, it's not Sweet Child of Mine, in other words. But it's also got Strange Kind of Woman, Lazy, and Space Trucking, and then Black Knight, Speed King, and Lucille. The one song on here I skip every fucking time. And this was a trend of 70s uh, live albums and 80s live albums. And I could, I guess I could probably kick every live album in the balls for this because uh, with the exception of Rush live albums with The Professor, I don't want to hear a fucking drum solo. And Ian Pace is a killer drummer. He's an amazing drummer. He's probably one of the better drummers that most people don't really ever think of as being a killer drummer unless you're a drummer. But I just don't want to hear... A, let's take a look here. I want to see how long that song is. A nine and a half minute drum solo. Only guy I ever want to hear a nine and a half minute drum solo is Neil Peart, and he can't do one anymore because he's not with us anymore. But that's the only guy I never went and took a piss or grabbed a beer or got something to drink during a show with drum solos because fuck drum solos. Inagata DeVita killed any desire I ever have of wanting to hear a drum solo in a rock context. If I'm listening to jazz or I'm listening to fusion, it's a little different because the drummers 
are different. I do like Gavin Harris in a porcupine tree. He does very interesting things. Also, Simon um, Phillips protocol. I mean, there's a lot of drummers I like, but I just don't want to hear a nine-minute drum solo. Even, even live, I struggle with it, but I can deal with it a little bit more live than I can on an album. Skip it. See ya. It's a good drum solo, but I don't care after I've heard it once. I don't want to hear it again. So, Deep Purple, made in Japan. For all you young whippersnappers that may be watching this, if you don't know this album, this live album, you absolutely should because it's fucking essential. And that leads to the one album I could not find, which I have. So I'm going to hold up a prop. Rainbows Rising. One of my absolute all-time favorite albums. I have it. I just can't find it um, in my, my shit. I was able to locate a bunch of other stuff, but I couldn't find it. I found most of the other ones, but I couldn't find Rainbow Rising. Um, Rainbow Rising, probably in my top five albums of all time, maybe. Certainly top ten without question, but probably top five. Um, you know, you have Starstruck, Carol Woman... Uh, you have, oh uh, shit, I don't have it on me so I can't look it up and I can't memorize the, uh, I didn't memorize the, um, titles, but the one song I don't particularly like is track two and it's Running With The Wolf, Run With The Wolf, I think, I should know this, but I don't remember it off the top of my head, cheese, I know, that was terrible to fucking do that, but my memory because of my illness sometimes struggles with things that I don't have in front of me. That's why I read a lot of this stuff off because I, I I can't recall titles of songs really, really well. I started noticing that I was having trouble with remembering lyrics a couple years ago and now it's, you know, it's bad. So anyways, track number two, it just sounds too bar rocky, bluesy for Dio. I just, it reminds me too much of Elf. So, um, oops. My light just went out. So, anyway, I'm almost done. Uh, but, yeah, Rising, Rainbow Rising, damn near perfect album. Track number two, Something of the Wolf. Sorry, I forgot the title. Uh, next to last one, I'm actually going to throw one more bonus at you, is this killer album, which I don't know if any of you are going to know, but Peter Murphy, who was once the singer of Bauhaus, did has done a lot of solo albums and most of them are exceptionally good but one of them is damn near perfect and that is 1989's Deep I love this album I still listen to it quite frequently it has some of my absolute favorite favorite songs certainly Peter Murphy songs but just songs in general on it uh, Deep Ocean Vast Sea Marlene Dietrich's favorite poem, the devil, the line between the devil's teeth and that which cannot be repeat. And then the massively fucking badass song cuts you up. If you like goth, if you like Bauhaus, if you like alternative rock, hard rock and rock, this album is killer, but it has one song on it that I just do not like. And that is Roll Call at the end. The one is okay, but they double it up with a reprise and one's eight minutes long and the other's six minutes long. And it's boring. It's just a boring track that doesn't go anywhere. It's pretty terrible. It, it Thankfully, it's at the end of the album, but it kind of ruins the album for me. And the last one, which... I don't think this belongs here, but I'm going to say it anyways. Point of No Return from Kansas. It's pretty much a perfect album for me. It's got dust in the wind on it. But you know, I listened to it earlier today and I still love that song. So it's close. It's it's kind of one of those that if I had to listen to it regularly, I'd probably skip it. But since I don't and it's, you know, I throw it on every once in a while, Dust in the Wind still doesn't make me want to puke. It's, it's a bit of a cheese baggy song and yeah, it was a giant radio hit and that's all you heard in the in the 70s on radio rock when I lived in Houston, Texas. But it's still a pretty fucking good song, and I love the finger picking on it. It's got beautiful melodies, and uh, so this one is a real push. But hey, that's what I got for you, man. So hopefully you enjoyed some of those, and um, I'm going to be doing a deep dive this weekend on Friday night with Serge and maybe a mystery guest. It's going to be on Skinny Puppy. So check us out on Friday night 
8 o'clock probably. I hate to be competing with Marty, but I have no choice. That was when the guy was available, and um, the other, the one guy was only available on Friday night, and so we're hoping he's still 50-50 whether he's going to show, but I hope he is. Um, should have a thumbnail up tomorrow, hopefully, or maybe the next day. Rick's helping me out there. Uh, again, deep dive on Friday night on my channel, 8 o'clock on Skinny Puppy. And next Friday, assuming that I'm still able to do these, and it really is a day-to-day -day thing for me, um, based on a lot of the symptoms I'm dealing with, uh, we're looking to do the Opeth deep dive finally. My buddy John um, Kamiski from Metalheads Podcast is going to be with us. And we had to do it again Friday night because John was only available Friday night after Thanksgiving, 26. So it's John. Uh, Serge is going to be with me. I believe Rick from the Dreadful Minutes is going to be with me. I'm hoping Nick from Thralls of Metal is going to be with me. And I'm hoping that Devin, Maze of Torment, the little bastard, is going to be with me as well. Uh, so it looks to be a six-person panel uh, at this point, And we're going to deep dive into Opeth's killer catalog. So join me this Friday and next Friday for deep dives, hopefully. See you guys. Thanks for tuning in and uh, check some of those albums out. If you don't have them or don't know them, go check them out and uh, check out Rock Scout's original video, his OG video, and uh, check out Mad at the Dark Path, his video, and Thralls of Metal. I probably don't have to say that because they've got like 8,000 subs now, so check them out too. All right. Later.